Hello. And welcome to The Loop Show. And welcome to some summer's evenings and the chance to go flying after work. Thank goodness for all that. Anyway, what's coming up in the show? This month we have an exclusive flight test of the Robinson R66. And we also talk to the Mothman of Northrop, Henry Labouchere, about the aircraft he knows and loves. Anyway, before all that, let's look at the world of business aviation. And our man DC gets to the sharp end of all the coolest cockpits in Geneva, eBase, the big international business aviation show. Thanks, Rich. Here at eBase, it's been a busy three days. Clearly, confidence is returning to the industry with tons of views coming out. As the show opened, Bombardier announced a new name for the Global XRS Express. It's now called the Global 6000 and plugs a gap in the range from Global 5000, 7000 and 8000. Big deals are back after a flat two years. VistaJet announced a deal with Bombardier for 18 jets worth $383 million. And Piaggio announced a few more details about its proposed jet, known as the P1XX for now. It's going to be bigger than the Avanti turboprop and have longer range. There will be more details announced at the MBAA show in October. Cess has been in the news for not terribly good reasons for the departure of CEO Jack Pelton. However, the good news is that Cessna has just got the ARSA type certification for the Cessna Citation CJ4 clearing the way for European sales. And as for aircraft on display here, Hawker's King Air 250 made its European debut. The best thing about coming to an air show are the new aircraft. And here is the Hawker Beechcraft King Air 250, which is a significant upgrade on the 200 GT. We spoke to the pilot who flew it from America, Greg Kemplin. This is the newest and latest version of what was uh, the 200 King Air that people have been so popular with. Uh, the previous version was the 200 GT, and this is the new version. Uh, the biggest primary changes are the added winglets, a new designed composite made prop. And then the, lastly is the Ram Air Recovery System that's been created and designed by Raysback Engineering. And the biggest difference is allowing us to have additional takeoff performance at sea level at gross weight. We're now down to 2,100 feet. And then it's also made a vast difference on the high hot uh, at elevated airports on warm days. Our takeoff performance is far superior than what it was previously. But the nice thing about it is you do not have to go high in order to have the efficiency. If you need to fly into the 20s, you don't pay a large penalty in your fuel flow or your airspeed. So this is the only one in existence at the moment. They will start coming off the factory line probably late June and start being available before too long to, uh, to new clients and customers. All of the paperwork, all the flight testing has already been done. and We're literally just waiting for uh, the FAA to, uh, to give us their blessing. Uh, the base price of the airplane is $5.79 million. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Have a great flight back. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Sometimes it takes the small guys to show the big guys how to do it. Next in Aerospace have produced a 400 XT. It's based on the old Beach Jet 400, but it's had a massive upgrade everywhere. Hawker, meanwhile, have seen what they've done, liked it, and produced their own version called the 400 XPR. This is the European debut for the 400 XT. We spoke to Nexon Aerospace to find out how they did it. Uh, what we do is we start with a Hawker 400A or 400 XP, and we take it through our remanufacturing process. So we replace all the life-limited components on the airplane. We put much more fuel-efficient engines. Uh, it increases the range significantly on the airplane. We uh, replace the avionics suite up front, so we moved to a Collins Proline 21 avionics suite. And then we've made a couple of aerodynamic enhancements to the plane. And what we end up with is 150% more range than the original airplane that operates at about 35% less on a cost per hour basis. And you've also upgraded the interior as well. That's correct. When you purchase a 400 XT, you, you have a complete custom interior, custom paint uh, option. It's delivered as a brand new airplane. So where are you in the process of uh, producing this aircraft? We're just about at the final certification. Uh, the engine, the Williams FJ44 3AP, was just certified on Thursday. Uh, that was the last major hurdle uh, for the certification process. We expect the final STC to be issued sometime in late June and then we hope to begin deliveries of the plane in July. What do you think is the nearest rival to this aircraft? Uh, you'd have to look at new, uh, the other new production clean sheet airplanes like the Phenom 300 or the CJ4. If you were to look at our performance, very similar to those airplanes, but my product, because it's a remanufactured product, I'm able to deliver it about 50 cents on the dollar. It's about half the price, uh, the purchase price that those airplanes are. So what's that price? Uh, base price on this airplane is $3.975 million. Thank you very much, Joe. My pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. It's not just about new aircraft. There's quite a lot of new products being announced here as well. Rockwell Collins have launched the HGS 3500, which is a head-up display for smaller business aircraft. Just down the lane from them, Honeywell are showing the Ovation Select, which is a cabin infotainment system. 
due for certification in July, and the first customer is going to be in Brea with its legacy 450 500. Elsewhere, BAE announced a new interior for its Avro business jet. It's designed by UK company Design Q, it's called the Elegante. With an aircraft as big as the Avro, you can afford to be lavish. And finally, Thrain and Thrain have launched a super new in flight phone. It's the smallest and lightest in its class. You just need the right aircraft to put it in. Hmm, what about the new Falcon 2000S? The Salt is one of Europe's top aerospace manufacturers and it's got a fabulous range of high end business aircraft. A bit too high for some because the Falcon 2000 LX, which used to be their starter model, is $33 million. So this week they've launched the Falcon 2000S. We spoke to Olivier Villa, father of the project. Uh, with this aircraft, we want to be the strongest competitor in the super mid sized market where you find aircraft from uh, Bombardier, Gulfstream, and Hawker in the 3000 nautical miles plus. With this aircraft, we propose an entry level Falcon with a 3300 nautical mile range and a 25 million price range. In order to compete well in this market, we standardized the interior the best we could in terms of systems and also uh, furniture, seats for the comfort level. But it's standardized and this allowed us to reduce greatly the prices. How do you choose the lower range? We, we have a different fuel system, different tank configuration, but same power. And also, what we've done on this aircraft is uh, modify the aerodynamics in order to be able to have the best possible short field capability. We have a full uh, leaning edge slat, inboard and outboard, and winglets, and this aircraft will be certified at the shortest possible uh, airfield. When do you expect to certify the aircraft and start deliveries? We are well into the flight test. The first aircraft has been flying since February this year. It will be certified before the end of next year and will deliver to customers very early 2013. Thank you very much, Oli. You are very welcome. So that's it for Luke TV's coverage of eBay this year. For more, see P1's iPad app due out in mid-June. For now, back to the studio. Thanks, DC. Now, as he pointed out there, P1 is going on to the iPad, so be sure to check the App Store soon for that. New helicopters don't come along very often, but when Frank Robinson launched the R-22 back in 1979, it turned the world on its head and became the fastest selling helicopter. Old Frank has been at it again with the R-66, his first foray into the turbine market. So let's head off to Northampton. I'm here at Sloan Helicopters headquarters based at Cywell to test the brand new Robinson R66 turbine. This is the latest helicopter to come out of the Torrance factory and our flight tester Jamie Chalkley has got a lot of turbine experience so he's going to see how it stacks up. The R66 is a helicopter of first. It's Robinson's first step into the turbine market powered by the brand new Rolls-Royce RR300. It's the only helicopter in production with this engine. With five seats, 120 knot crews, and a range of 325 nautical miles, it's certainly attractive for those looking for their first turbine. And with a base price of just 798,000 US dollars, it's affordable too. I wasn't quite sure what to expect from the 66. I got quite a bit of uh, turbine experience in various helicopters. And I have to say, from the flight I did, I think Robinson's hit the nail on the head with this one. They've, they've absolutely got it right. It's another low cost option from Robinson, which is going to get more people flying turbines. It's got the extra seat that the 44 never had. And the difference in price between the 44 and a Jet Ranger to charter is a reasonable margin. And I, I think from uh, if the operating costs um, are kept down on the 66, which they look like they will, and certainly the buying costs are, then I think there's definitely a market it's going to grab between the two products. So the option of the fifth seat, it's a bit faster, and a lot of people like flying in turbines, so I think it's got some legs to go in that area of the market. The start system is something I'm most uh, impressed at. Um, they've gone completely past the old days of having to open a throttle, hold a button, don't let go of the button because you're going to get a hot start. And they've got a very simple, press the button, it latches, um, it takes care of itself. And unless anything goes wrong, you press a button, you push a plunger in, and, it, and it's going to start. It's a system that seems to work pretty well. 
thought the controls were really nicely balanced. The pedals aren't hydraulically boosted, they're a little bit heavier um, than the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the controls in terms of um, pressure, but that's not uncommon with the various types in the marketplace. Overall, it flew, it flew really nice. Um, it's still got a, a two-bladed rotor system, so you, you do end up with the high cruise tuper uh, sort of vibration through the cabin, but no different than a, uh, than a 206, and it's probably better than a 44. Overall, I was quite impressed. Thanks to Sloan Helicopters, it looks like the Torrance factory is going to be busy for some time. Uh, it looks like that. This 66 is a classic in the making, but when it comes to existing classics, something over 60 to 65 years old, they don't get much more love than the Tiger Moth and the Moth series. Now I went off to deepest and darkest Norfolk to discover more about these aircraft from the man they call Mr Moth. Now, in the annals of British aviation history, few aircraft cause as much warmth to flow through pilots' bodies as this, the de Havilland Tiger Moth. Designed by Geoffrey de Havilland himself in the very early 1930s, it was the archetypal biplane trainer for RAF pilots and other pilots all around the world for many years after the war. Now, of course, you can't own an 80-year-old design without knowing a fair bit about mechanics and engineering and the piloting skills to fly an absolute classic. We've come today to speak to one of the very well-known experts in Moss, Henri Le Boucher. The Moth has something of a rose tinted reputation I was saying that people think it's easy to fly you just hop in it and fly around and you don't necessarily think that's the truth. Well, well it, it is easy to fly it's, it must be easy to fly if I can fly it. When you get a really um, good moth pilot they're an absolute pleasure to watch they're fantastic. The tiger moth was built as a trainer and that's why it's built in such huge numbers and that's why it's got the following it's got it's not a particularly good aeroplane by aeroplane standards. In fact, it doesn't climb, it doesn't roll, it's not very nice in pitch, and um, you have to be quite a good operator and keep it well balanced. You have to have a good idea about conserving energy. And um, stall turns are not the easiest because you don't have much time or power. Now, if you can fly a moth well, you won't have any trouble flying anything else. And of course it's aerobatically capable as well. Yes. And I think yes. you were very much of the mind that if aerobatics is something you can master in the moth, then Absolutely, because you you've really got no power it. and you've got no uh, controls. Um, it's, uh, if you can master aerobatics in the moth, you'll be great. I mean, you leap into something like an extra and it's um, quite honestly moderately easy. Um, you've got so much power, you've got such a rate of roll, but of course, Things like extras and sukhois are doing manoeuvres now that weren't even thought of when these things were about. Mm -hmm. Henry, you're known for your tiger moths, but this project that we've just discovered here, G. Amy, it's a very famous gypsy moth from 1929. Well, yes, it, it really came into my care after um, the Out of Africa film, which it uh, did in Kenya. It came back to this country, it was bought by a friend of mine, and um, I looked after it thereafter. Um, it was restored by Cliff Lovell, and actually it's very much in the condition that he restored it now, which is a credit to his work. What's your experience of it in terms of how you think it is as an aircraft to fly? It's gorgeous. It's uh, very well harmonised, warm, comfy, and it just purrs along at a very low power setting, doing about 80 to 90 miles an hour. So in the 1930s, when the RAF decided they wanted a new biplane trainer, why on earth didn't they pick this? Well, the main problem with this was, um, as you can see, the front cockpit where the instructor sits is um, right underneath the petrol tank. Well, uh, first of all, I don't think the instructors are very keen at sitting underneath 18 gallons of uh, petrol. 
Plus, they couldn't get out with their parachutes because their head hit the tank, and it was quite difficult to get out, even with the door open, which opens kind of like that. But it's still a heck of a job to get out. So what happened was we went across to uh, the Tiger Moth, uh, where they moved the centre section forward um, over the uh, front of the front cockpit over here. You can see it's removed quite far back from the trailing edge of the wing. The instructor could jump straight out. In this specific example, GB, and you've had a bit of a lifelong love affair with it. I've had it for 40 years this year. It's been a wonderful old friend to me, and I've been all over the place in it. And um, I've got it flying quite how I want it to. But this one was built in Australia, and um, the, the Australian ones do differ in a number of respects. And have you managed to keep track and roughly how many hours you have in this example? Well, I sort of go on engines, really. <laughs> this, is, this is my third engine, so it must be about 3,000 hours. I, I love this old thing, and um, it's like an old pair of um, bedroom slippers to me. I just sort of jump in and roar off. Henry, I can only just thank you, firstly, for flying me today, and secondly, for taking us through the history of the moth and your own. Thank you ever so much, indeed. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Now, just to say a huge thanks again to Henry Labouchere. He's the go-to guy for anything to do with moths, and a fantastic pilot, and a personal thanks from me for giving me a really good demonstration of what the moth is still capable of this very day. Anyway, that's all we've got time for this month. Before we go, don't forget you can upload your own aviation videos to looptv.aero simply by clicking the link on the left-hand side of the page and following the simple instructions. Until next month, goodbye. Cheerio.